Thank you, thank you for the too kind introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm very excited. This is my first uh, in-person seminar since EPFL, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last March. Um, yeah, so I will uh, want to uh, report some recent results on. Ah, okay. Yeah, final. Oof, yeah, <laughs> I have to wear this to teach at Yale. Yeah, so some uh, new results on. Um, a uh, class of problems I called uh, assignment problems with planted structures. So this is joint work with Jen Ding at Penn, Jiaming Xu and uh, Sophie Yu at Duke, and Dana, whose assignments right now, and joining uh, Cornell next spring. Um, right. So let me start with maybe a high-level overview and contrast with maybe more uh, familiar problems uh, in graphs uh, that has this planted structure. So I think a uh, recurring theme recurring question that people ask uh, in any statistical inference is how to reconstruct certain latent structures from noisy observations. And this is of particular interest in uh, um, statistical problem arising in network analysis. For instance, what you want to achieve is to uh, transform a uh, network which is more messy than this and all tangled into something which is cleaner and reveals the community structure, right? So I'm sure many of you heard about the problem of community detection and worked on it yourself. And this is a classical example. And even earlier, there are problems, uh, let's say, planted clique, uh, a clique hidden in a early training graph, which is all of this flavor, and more generally, uh, clustering at large. OK, and uh, I think our underlying um, structure or theme to all of these problems is the, in, in, is the inherent low rankness of the data in the sense of if you take your observation as a matrix, it's, right, it's the, the, the expectation of which is a low rank matrix or low rank tensor and this is type of stuff. And this low rankness drives the design analysis of many algorithms. Some of them are of a spectral type, some of them are of convex realization type and so on and so forth. So it's very high level overview of this huge line of research. Uh, and then there's more recently a new set of problems. I mean, some of them are not that recent, actually, mm -hmm. which I call uh, planted assignment problems that does not have these low rank structures at all, where the latent variables is usually a permutation or a matching or assignment or vertex correspondence and so on and so forth. So in those problems, if you look at the data as a matrix, and the expectation of the, that matrix is no low rank at all. Right? For instance, it's a permutation matrix, plus some constants maybe. And for example, uh, let me just maybe mention a few uh, uh, problems of this form. Uh, some of them I would dive in as the main topic for today in bipartite matching, where uh, hey there, <laughs> yeah. So the paper that uh, introduced this model it's a physics paper by Chertoff et al. that look at uh, how do you extract uh, as a, la a, a latent pr uh, matching from a data where you observe a bipartite graph and the weights are somewhat correlated with this hidden matching. So this was just the planted version of the random assignment model. And then when we move on to more difficult problems in where you observe two graphs as opposed to one, and the goal is to find the latent matching by maximally correlated these two graphs, and that's the line of research known as graph matching or network alignment. I think some, some, of, them, some of the work are due to people here. Um, so that's something I will mention as the second part of the talk. And in addition to those, there are problems like traveling salesperson, or traveling uh, to find the Hamiltonian cycle, Hamiltonian uh, path um, um, that has this latent structure or more generally finding trees and k factors and so on and so forth. So all of them start to deviate from these models where you observe low rankness and uh, like many of the algorithm needs to be reinvented, right? So there's this classical spectral algorithm that won't work here and there's a new spectral method invented. So today I will uh, just to discuss maybe two vignettes uh, uh, along this line of this suite of problems and focus more on the statistical aspects in the sense of I want to discuss information direct limits, uh, lower bounds, uh, to complement what we know about algorithms and mention things that we do not know uh, 
if they can achieve with good algorithm and so on and so forth. So I will start with linear assignment, and uh, which corresponds to the planted bar patet matching problem. And then I will, if I have time, I will discuss the quadratic assignment problem. I think I tried this talk uh, twice before, and uh, I don't get too much to discuss about this. So, yeah, but maybe just to give you some general flavor, um, depending on also how many questions you have. But feel free to ask any questions anytime. <laughs> Uh, so I start with linear assignment. So with the model that was proposed in this physics paper by Chertoff et al. So the setup is the following: you observe that the observation is a weighted bar parallel graph. Right? So that has a hidden perfect matching m star. M star are these red edges. And then, uh, in addition to these red edges, there are n times m minus one pairs. Then you connect them independently with some probability, as a d over n. So d could be a constant, or d could grow. Or could D could be n, right? It's completely connected. Okay, so and then uh, the uh, latent, latent matching is reflected in the weight distribution, right? For red edge weights, it's drawn from some law p, otherwise it's drawn from some law q, right? You can think about yeah, we have different means, for instance. And the goal is to reconstruct this hidden matching from the weighted observed graph that do not have these colors. You want to know where is the red edges, right? So. So that's the picture. All right, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. So in the no model, no version of this model where the two laws are the same, let's say exponential one, and the graph is fully connected, so this is the famous random assignment pro problem where there was a physics conjecture of Mazar and Parisi that says, oh, the minimum cost to this uh, mean weight um, um, by part of the matching problem is equal to zeta two, and then uh, you know in a sequence of papers, final Aldous proved it, and this was how I guess this local weak convergence tool was invented, and so on and so forth. It's, it's very nice as result, and this is this model can be thought as a planted version of the random assignment problem. Any, any questions so far? Good. Yeah, please. Yeah. In the random assignment problem, it's yeah. always about the min cost. The mean cost, right? Just a right, or right. So I, I will describe the statistical meaning of the mean cost matching. It's maximum likelihood. Right. right. So this is the uh, Chertoff et al. Uh, physics paper. They introduced this problem for the following applications, which they call particle tracking. So you can think about uh, the following scenario where you have m particles that are moving, diff diffusing in a in a random environment, and uh, what you observe, uh, let's say this picture shows you two uh, snapshots of this uh, bag of particles at two time instants. At time zero, they are the blue ones, uh, they are the red ones, and then after another time, they moved randomly to the blue dots. Right. So the goal is to, let's say, you take measurements from them by m looking at their pairwise distance, and from the pairwise distance, you want to construct this second panel, which tells you the matching, right? So which particle moved to which? So you can do some maybe greedy methods, right? So because they don't tend to move very far, but some of them do move quite far. So you can do a, maybe a global type of. No, yes, please. So how much information do you lose by um, ignoring the sort of geometric embedding of yeah. the points? Very good versus? question. Very very excellent question. So this model, which is based on pairwise distance, and the, the on top of that, this simple model postulates basically a, s a mean field approximation by assuming all of the distances are pairwise. Right? This is like the same thing people did with the average case of the TSP problem. There's a recent paper um, here by Kuniski and uh, Niles Weed that analyzed uh, this problem where you observe not just a pairwise distance, but something more informative that is actually their positions at time zero and time one. So there you can, it's a low dimensional data. Uh, I mean, not low, yeah. So because it, they live in two dimensional, three dimensional space. So you can analyze, for instance, the mean weight matching and how does it work and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, th so in this work, we're not using this information just to take it as a first order approximation. Very good question. So in the specific model they, they did was everything is fully connected. And then there are two possible way distribution. If the same particle, then um, according to a diffusion type of reasoning, the distance that they, they assume is an absolute value of a Gaussian. 
Otherwise, it's just two random points in the squares, which is, tends to be typically far away. Right? So it's a uniform between 0 and n. So this is uh, in the paper. This is not sparse graph, right? This is dense, right. So uh, here, the d could be a constant, in which case it's quite sparse. It could be also as large as d. So, right. so they did a, a replica calculation and found that there is some critical threshold for the kappa, for the Right? So kappa basically tells you the time of the diffusion. If kappa is too large, then you cannot tr track them accurately. Otherwise, you can. So there is something which is about 0 0.76, 176. Uh, below this threshold, MPA is uh, most probable assignment, which is maximum likelihood, which is this mean uh, weight matching, is identical to the planted one. Otherwise, the overlap is, uh, is, is not perfect and uh, so on and so forth. Okay. So it turns out that if you do the analysis, it turns out to be 1 over 2 pi is the threshold. Um, and the, 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 the main purpose of this talk is to actually analyze where is the optimal threshold, and the hard part is in the lower bound. Okay. So let me... Uh, Wait, so who, who proved the exact expression? But not them, right? Yeah, so, so this is a corollary of the results I will show you next. Ah, okay. Yeah. So. So yeah, the statistical uh, uh, significance of mean weight matching or maximum weight matching here is actually maximum likelihood, right? So maximum likelihood in this special case just maximize the total log likelihood over all matchings, right? You sum over likelihood from the n edges and you search for the one that maximizes this. And this is linear assignment. It's computed in polynomial time by let's say Hungarian algorithm or you can just solve linear programming for this. So computationally, this is easy. Uh, and then, OK, you can ask the question like was asked in the physics paper. I mean, how much does, uh, h how well is this, uh, how good is this estimate uh, by looking at its overlap. So overlap is just the number of edges you actually reconstructed correctly. Right? So, there's, so it's just intersection of this. Or you can write it as 1 minus the error. Right? So this overlap is between 0 and 1. Uh, uh, but maybe a more uh, general question is, well, I mean, why did you max analyze maximum likelihood? Maximum likelihood actually uh, doesn't maximize the less expected overlap, right? So, it's, um, so, so even if you analyze this very accurately, it doesn't tell you, is this the actual uh, information threat limits for which, uh, which is actually the, the main object of this talk. Uh, and if you want to phrase the information theoretic limits, uh, you can guess perhaps it's in terms of two quantities. First is the, is the, is the average degree, how sparse they are, how many red, blue edges they are. Right? So if there are more, then it's, it makes you, you know, e easier to be confused. And then also the second thing is the similarity between the two laws. If the two laws is very different, one always says apple, the other one always says orange, then of course you can find it perfectly. So before we present what the theory is, it's probably in terms of these two quantities. So it turns out that uh, there is one parameter that measures this similarity between these is the Barachera coefficient or the Hellinger infinity, which is, just the which is the integral of the geometric mean of these two laws. Okay. So the theorem that I will prove the, in this paper uh, is the following. So first is the positive results. Uh, if this condition holds, Right, so this says that the average degree is not too big or the similarity is not too large. Then uh, let's say solving linear assignment succeeds to achieve overlap that goes to 1, almost perfect. And this is actually quite easy. It's a simple first moment computation. And the second part is the main result, which says this condition is actually tight up to the exact constant. Right, so let me, fr let me parse it. So if you are epsilon above this threshold, then no algorithm can achieve overlap that converge to one. Right? So in both sparse models, where the three parameters, d and the two laws, are fixed, or in the dense model in the reasonable, in the meaningful scaling, where the blue edge weights is a dilation of a fixed density. So what does it mean? It means for every node, there is roughly d edges attached to it that are blue, the minimum of which is is competitive with the red one, right? So if you, so I'll, I'll say this in a second. So this was conjectured in another physics paper. I think it's by Samarjan, Sikuro, and Zabadova. 
think in PRE last year, uh, they, uh, they considered both models, and this is the conjecture they put forth, and uh, it turns out to be correct. So for the exponential model, which is the planted version of the random assignment problem, let's say, and fully connected as usual, so the red edge weights has some parameter lambda, which is a constant, then the blue edge weights has mean n, right? Therefore, if you look at the minimum of n independent exponential 1 over n, you get exponential 1, which is on par with this planted uh, red edge. So, so you can imagine there is some threshold that makes it succeed. So this is actually happens if you evaluate this better general coefficient. Uh, it turns out to be at lambda equal to 4. And this was actually conjectured in uh, Moharami more and Su. Uh, which I will uh, explain in a second. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, so you say for all m hat, but here there is an obvious optimal algorithm, right? Which is, which is? <laughs> like whatever, like the yeah, which is like maximum posterior, maximum, yeah, posterior, uh, posterior probability. Right? Yes, yeah, which is hard to analyze. Yeah, but but in principle there is. No yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is some method that minimizes or maximizes the expected and that's what overlap. Probably physicists analyze, right? Because this is like mismatched. ML is a mismatched version of that, right? Yeah, the physics one, I'm not entirely sure. I think they analyze some version of the belief propagation. Right, which is yep. so, so yeah. So that's Probably it's closely related, okay. yeah. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, please. So is this, like, you may go there, but like, is this C like shrinking? Is it like a continuous transition? Uh, can you repeat again? Oh, sorry, is this C of S going to zero, as epsilon going to zero, or there is Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, good question. So there is no uh, jump yeah. in, in this. I'll show you. So this is yeah. actually goes to the next question, is uh, you can take another further look at what happened in exponential model. So if you are epsilon away from this threshold, one can take another refined analysis of this maximum likelihood estimator and show that you are very close to perfect overlap with a gap, which is not zero, that scales as e to the minus 1 over root epsilon. This turns out, it's surprisingly, this is actually exact. So you can prove no estimator can beat that with some different expert. Right, so this is a more refined uh, results at what happened near the, the, the criticality and uh, what is the exact overlap. Uh, so it turns out the error is shrinks uh, to zero as you approach the threshold at this e to the minus one over root epsilon speed. So this is corresponds to a phase transition that is infinite order in the sense that there's no jump. There is no jump even in any derivatives. So this was again predicted in the physics paper and here is a actual proof of that. So let me show you a picture that demonstrates this. So the analysis of the maximum likelihood in this case, which is just a algorithm, was done by Mohorami, Moore, and Su a few years ago that essentially generalized the local weak convergence based machinery that uh, was used by Aldous to, to prove the zeta 2 limits. Uh, and using this machinery, they can determine the value of the, optimal, of the overlap, not the optimal, achieved by maximum likelihood, linear assignment, as a function of lambda. And this is extracted by solving a coupled ODE system. So if you plot the solution, it's a picture of this form. After 4, it's exactly equal to 1. And approaching this 4 leave you a gap, which is e to the minus 1 over root epsilon. And this is all the derivative vanished here. Right? So it's a very smooth type of phase transition. And uh, so you can analyze this and uh, prove the upper bound. That is this. And so, so this was done in our paper following the physics paper kind of heuristics computation. But this is just analyzing existing results. And the hard part is to prove this is actually tight. OK, right. So I want to contrast what people know about other planted problem and the style of phase transitions in those problems. For instance, if you look at what happened in stochastic block model, um, so depending on how many groups you have, the, uh, the behavior of the phase transition could be either of second order. right? So this is. Uh, I mean, I didn't explain the parameter, but some these results are proved by some of the people here. Uh, this is like the signal noise ratio and cross. So the overlap, actually, the phase transition is 0 or not 0. Right, so below this, nothing works. You can only achieve a trivial overlap. And then it starts to become non-zero. So this is what happened with two groups. And with more groups, the picture is more murky. I think this is conjectured. If you have five or more, 
then there's a jump at some threshold which is unknown from zero to something strictly non-zero. So this is a, what physics call a first order phase transition where the value of the overlap actually jumps and this is where the value is continuous but the derivative jumps. Um, and in this case, uh, everything is continuous. But yes, that, please. That, yeah. The potential is for partial recovery, right? That's correct. So here, the overlap, the transition point is from zero to non-zero, right? right? But what do we have this? I don't even know what the answer, but for the block models, what happens when you talk about complete reconstruction? Don't you also OK, have good, good question. Uh, that's my intuition, but I didn't know that. Sort of I think in this case, unless this goes to infinity, the overlap is never approaching one, right? It's always something close. Right, yeah. 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 Uh, so there's not a threshold after which it's exactly yeah, one, right. which is what the happened here. The study is recovering everybody, everybody, which you're not studying for the matching problem. Right, right, right yeah. Uh, OK, so um, and then there's something very similar that happened in the spike model with sparsity. As some sparsity is sort of second order, and below, and which actually the problem is easy computationally. And after that, it's uh, hard. And the, there's a jump. So this order of phase transitions, there's a, there's a I forgot the name, uh, by the first author, I think, Semergen, and uh, other physics paper, has a paper uh, called Typographies of Phase Transition, where they relate this to computational easiness or hardness. Um, but I don't have anything deep to say. So this is what turns out to be. Yeah. But this is not observed in any of the other type of planted problems before. Wait, could you say yeah. more about uh, yeah, please. So what are the connections, the computational versus statistical trade-offs for this? Uh, I mean, somehow these are jumps of so optimal yeah. algorithms anyway. So it's not really like a landscape uh, discontinuity, right? So in this, I, I think. Um, the physics f might believe that uh, this type of discontinuity I is related to computational hardness, where if you don't have this, like here in this picture, you can run many other algorithms. Um, in this case, there's no computational issue at all. As, as far as achieving, let's say, this behavior, right, even at the threshold, and then this behavior, you can run linear assignment. If you want to achieve exactly the optimal one, I don't know. So this is uh, open. Uh, yeah, please. Let me make a comment on that. The paper, yeah. Back in the 90s, there was a paper, a couple of papers, that tried to connect, at least uh, computationally, if there is evidence of phase transition, the type of the phase transition, and the, and the hardness. And they did it for three steps. It was Kilpatrick and uh, Kelman, several other people. But uh, then it was realized that for K set, and they did it for three steps. Then it was realized for K set that this phase transition Hardness transition occurs way before the satisfiability transition. So it was already not. It didn't point. make sense. It didn't, uh, it's, yeah. it, it didn't make sense. The other thing is that I think for percolation, the phase transition is second order. It doesn't have a derivative. But percolation is algorithmically a simple problem. It's just, you know, a short, it's a connectivity problem. So it's not sure okay. if it, it wouldn't be, again make any sense. Right. Yeah, because I, I mean, a priori, it's harder to interpret like a threshold here as being like an algorithmic uh, barrier. But yeah, I think one, one way to think about it sometimes is that you just add a little, a little bit, like it's a robustness. Here. Yeah. Right, so changing the parameter a little bit, just you add a little bit. Of yeah. Oh, I see. And then yeah. the things change dramatically with respect to some other. I see. Find it hard to do. I see. I see. So, so that's the, the discontinuity. Right. Yeah, I see. Yeah. It's, I think it's just an intuition. I okay, so l let me move on maybe to how to prove this. Um, uh, I made a bit t too many interpretations, perhaps. So, so let me just maybe f briefly explain the proof of the positive results. Uh, and uh, just to set up, where do you see these uh, Barachera coefficients? And then I will explain the negative results more. Um, and uh, just a quick comment that you can kind of use a reduction-based argument to show that you only need to focus on the sparse case. Uh, and I don't think I have time to explain the exponential model results, which is more refined. OK, so you can do a simple union bound to analyze the maximum likelihood as follows. You look at how many matchings that made t er two t errors. Right? So there's roughly n to the t of them. And then for each of these matchings to beat the ground truths would require introducing uh, T wrong edges, which is blue, and remove uh, 
uh, t, t right edges which are correct, and this quantity right uh, has a has a is on average uh, bigger than the other one. Therefore, this is a rare event, and this event right has a typical large deviation behavior, which you can simply compute by turn of bound, and the exponent has the Butler-Sharer coefficient built in. So this is where it shows up. And they also related to the sparsity, uh, to the average, uh, to the edge density. So also for taking the union bound, we'll tell you the, the right. So this is well known, actually. OK, uh, good. So the hard part is to prove, uh, actually, the negative results, right? So information theoretically, there is nothing better than uh, maximum likelihood as far as threshold is concerned. So uh, you cannot just stop at analyzing maximum likelihood. So you have to analyze let's say, optimal algorithm, like Yuri said. So here, instead, what we analyze is the behavior of the posterior distribution of the plant of the hidden matching, uh, conditioning on the data. Right? So this is some random distribution. It has this Gibbs form. Right? It's proportional to the total likelihood right? uh, that you put on this matching, uh, conditioning on the weights. So this is just some distribution over n factorial uh, objects. Uh, so what you need to show is, uh, is right, so this, the behavior of this tells you um, right, it will inform you about whether you can do it or not. So in the following sense, so there is a very simple, well-known, but crucial observation is that you can analyze the following estimator, which is guaranteed to be optimal within a factor of two, right? Which is you sample from the posterior. So we are in the business of information theory analysis, so I don't care whether I can do it efficiently or not, but it's well-defined, it's a randomized estimator. And it's a very simple proof. Uh, you can reconstruct it yourself, because from a statistician point of view, the resampled version and the ground truths are exactly the same. Right? So the joint law between the estimator and the ground truth and the estimator and the, uh, the resampled version are exactly the same, and it's a matter of triangle inequality. Okay? So we analyze this. I mean, still, it is a very difficult object to understand because this is some random distribution. So then what you prove is the following thing. Um, so what you want to show is that with high probability, the behavior of this random distribution is as follows. Right, so in the set of good solutions, sorry, set of good solutions, those are close to ground truth. It puts uh, just small mass. Right, so those that are close to it by delta times n, and I call m near, so these are good solutions, but it puts more mass at the bad solution. So there's a separation between these two. So I normalized everything by the weight at the ground truth, but what matters is the ratio here, right? So if this happened, then if you sample something, you're going to land at the bad part with high probability. So this, is, this is how you, you prove this. Okay, so the, the first part is relatively simple. It's a truncated first moment computation. And the second part is, is the bulk of the paper, which is a constructive type of argument. So I need to actually find these matchings that are in the good set, such that their total uh, probability under this Gibbs distribution is large. Right, so this, is the, this requires some type of a scheme to do this. Um, okay, but this is the abstraction for this method, therefore it abstracts any algorithms. Right? So, um, okay, so let me discuss how it was done. So first, instead of talking about other matching than the ground truth, I can talk about their difference. So the difference between A matching and the true one is just some disjoint union of even cycles that alternates in color. Right? So these are the red one, these are the blue one. So let's say the ground truth is one to one, two to two, and then this dashed line, you do a cyclic shift on one to three and it remain four, and the difference is a six cycle, right, on this part. This part. So the goal is to find exponentially many long alternating cycles. Why long? Long by linear in n, right, because that's the loss I want to achieve in the end. That are augmenting, augmenting in the sense of it just has to have better likelihood. Right, so, so this is the goal, to prove the second part. And as we observed in the proof of the positive results, so these are rare events. So there's a uh, small probability for this to occur, for a given alternating cycle to be augmenting. But there is a lot of alternating cycles. So of course, in, then it uh, suggests naturally just to do a following strategy based on first and second moment calculation. If you look at the set of all such cycles uh, that are augmenting, uh, its expectation of the cardinality is exponential. As long as you're above the threshold, this is basically 
the opposite of the first uh, moment computation of the positive results. And then if you can prove, I mean, wishful thinking wise, that the, this second model is controlled by the first squared, then you can show the existence and also abundance of this type of alternating or good uh, augmenting cycles, right? There you'll be done. Unfortunately, this doesn't work as far as, far as uh, how much we tried, right? So if you compute it exactly, it's too big. The second moment explodes. And if you, even if you add a lot of aggressive truncations to make maybe this much smaller and this becomes small, but not too small, it still doesn't work. And because, okay. yes, please. Why the local will convert it in the was developed to begin with? Because the second moment fails mm, the unplanted model. Eh? So I, I, I thought that's why uh, Elders has invented the local will convergence to exactly address that. So is, is it the same sort of difficulty here, or is it completely different? So, um, so. So I think the way to rescue the situation is not, not to do the full second moment computation, but not to use any low convergence machinery. Not using, you don't Not to use using, it. yeah. OK, so the, the idea, but uh, as, and the, this type of uh, um, phenomenon, I think, is also well known. For instance, in the random graph literature, if you want to find these large subgraphs, long cycles, it's usually some algorithmic type of argument, right? You do a depth first search. If you want to find a, a perfect matching at the right threshold, you check host condition, right? So this type of argument. So uh, this uh, second moment method directly applied doesn't work. Uh, that's, that's our belief. Um, so instead, you do something different. So the idea that was used uh, first in Aldo's paper, uh, also uh, Jen Ding uh, used it in his follow-up, to construct this type of long cycles has good weight properties is to do it in two stages. First, you find many short paths that are versus disjoint. So these are the small ingredients, has good weight properties. Then you do something called sprinkling to collect them into a long one. So you do it in two stages. In the first stage, perhaps you can accomplish it with a second moment calculation. And these type of things succeed because the path that you want to find is much shorter. These long cycles have huge correlation which, yeah, I should explain this. Um, maybe one way to see it is the following. Once you find a very long good cycle, you can do a lot of local modification to still make it good, right? You can swap one edge. So therefore, these solutions start to cluster. Then this is reflected when you look at the correlation between the indicator functions. So you do it in two stages. So let me explain this um, as follows. Um, Right, so for technical reasons, we want to reserve a part of the randomness to make sure these two stages operate independently. So you can reserve, so here let's reserve, a, let's say, a gamma fraction of vertices. Gamma is very, very small. And you use one minus gamma of the vertex to do stage one, which is to find many, many short, but short is a large constant. And I'll explain why large in a second. Path that whose total weight is good, right? So blue is big, bigger than red. Uh, using vertices which are uh, not reserved. And in the second stage, you just sprinkle this type of uh, edges that are connected to the reserved vertices and with the hope that this path can be connected into some long cycle. Right, so, this is, so this part of the randomness was never revealed, so you can uh, like decouple these two, type, two steps. Okay, so, that's, so the reason we want to choose uh, a very large short path is the following, because overall the property called augmenting is a global property, right? The total blue dominates the total red. Therefore, if this is, let's say, 100, so the bulk of the contribution is coming from stage one. If you ensure all of these are not just augmenting, but extra augmenting, then when you add these extra sprinkled edges, even they are not that good, right? Overall, they are still augmenting, right? So you leave a little bit of room, and this is the usual argument. OK, so the way you do it is the, uh, I mean, one way we, we did it is the following. Um, I want to find this uh, large collection, uh, collection of short paths. Right? So I'm describing this stage. Uh, so you have a bar parallel graph, the right part and the left part. So suppose you can achieve the following goal, that you can find a capital K collection of subsets of vertices on the right on the left and those on the right, such that for every pair, right, so every vertex in L1, every vertex in R1, they are connected by some path. And this path can be arbitrarily overlapping, because I'm going to pick one of them in the end. But across this uh, subset of vertices, they are completely disjoint. 
Okay, so, so let's suppose this can be achieved. And how many do you have here is linear in n, right? So everything else is just some large constant. So you can get yes, please. augmenting path is just something that accumulates large just yeah. you, right? Right, so blue, uh, total blue exceeds total red, so right. that's the but likelihood. By margin, right? But by some margin, Which right? So, so, so here, yeah, as I uh, said earlier, you need to do like epsilon augmenting okay. in order to make sure in the end you get. Right, you okay, get and, and now you partition the vertices left, right? So you need to construct this disjoint set of vertices, I will describe in a second, so that pairwise they are connected by some good path. So suppose this is achieved. Do you get to know what is VC no. Oh, so this is just a this is just set of non-reserved vertices. So this is ninety-nine percent of the vertices. But what about VC? So this seems to be VC and VC. Oh, this is just the prime in the in the right hand side. Okay, so you reserve so on the left and on the right. Right, right, okay. right. Thanks. So then I want to explain how do you connect them, right? So this is the one that I want to achieve using the vertices I have not inspected so far. So for instance, there's two paths here. I want to connect them into a cycle. So the way I do it is I first find those reserve vertices that are connected to some of these ones. And of course, their edges are blue. And then they, in turn, have some true matching. Right, so these, these bulbs. And suppose I can connect these, like here. Then I, find a, then I can connect them into a cycle. Right? So, so it goes. So this is what I need to find uh, that are incident to the reserve vertices. So how do I describe this operation? Well, I can kind of view this as a super node. And this is a super node. So I will have a picture of this form. Right? So in other words, I can look at the super graph where the super vertices are this. And they are naturally connected by some edge which was found in stage one. And the blue ones are the randomness in the second stage. So this picture, this graph, has the following character. Right? It's the early rainy type with the planted perfect matching. And you can choose the parameter in such a way that this super graph is very, very critical. It's very, very super critical. So the average degree is extremely large. So therefore, you can find these ones, which are a alternating cycle in this super graph that can expand into the original one. Right? So basically, you encode this, uh, this, this picture in, in here. And because you, this one has you know, you know, extra good weight properties, so the one when you add it together retains these good weight properties. So, and you can find these long cycles here using standard depth first search based argument. Right, so this is an actually you can find the exponential number of them. Uh, so that's uh, this second stage. In the first stage, uh, let me use uh, two minutes to explain it. So I need to construct this disjoint set of vertices which are pairwise connected by some good path. Right, so in the sparse model, it naturally suggests the following strategy. Uh, let me build a tree and use the leaf vertices as the set of uh, that are disjoint. Then this is the first part I find. Then I remove all of them, and I start to build the second tree and use the leaves as my second pair of sets, and so on and so forth. Right? So you can start with some arbitrary vertices, start to explore its neighborhood, and then say, oh, these are the, and then ensure somehow this total path has good weight properties, explain a second, and then remove those uh, inspected vertices and do it again. Think about grow a tree to the right. So this is the first pair, and then you do it for many, many times, right? So you, so what is the what is the uh, goal? Well, you want to ensure these weights are uh, what you desire. So these are good path augmenting, and you also don't want to waste too many vertices, right? Because for at least for technical convenience, the in, the vertices I inspected will be removed to ensure right the next explanation is independent. So the way to ensure the good weight properties is to, I mean, to keep checking if the weights has the total blue exceeds total red type of things. But there is an uh, extra twist here. So in order to not waste too many vertices, um, you're going to do it in, let's say, uh, in epochs. Right? So you grow the tree, uh, but you stop after depth h, and you check whether these vertices 
total blue is bigger than total red. And if those vertices are not good, you don't grow any tree. Uh, continue from that vertices. But those that are eligible, you continue to grow. By doing this, the fraction of vertices that you've thrown away actually only depend on the length of the epoch, but not on the total depth. And, uh, this is the, the usual thing. And the, the reason this, this uh, exploration succeeds is exactly because you're above the threshold. Right? So this exploration process behaves as a branching process, whereas the num average number of children is strictly bigger than one, because you're above the threshold. And this is where it kicks in. So this succeeds in finding those. And then if you put everything together, that's that. So let me not explain the, the for exponential model. Exponential model, basically, you need to do something different for this first stage. You can basically do the same thing for the second stage. Uh, if you do the tree type of construction, it's too wasteful. It doesn't give you e to the minus 1 over root epsilon. So instead, you just directly show there is a lot of good uh, path. Then you use Turan theorem to extract the independent set to make sure they are vertex disjoint. So there was the emergence of this e to the minus 1 over epsilon was actually was before in a paper by Ding and uh, Son and Wilson. It was a hard computation. Um, okay. So uh, any questions you have maybe about so this? Just, yes, just, please. Just to understand again, so this d, d squared bigger than 1? Yeah. That only arises for constructing this short augment, this like right. special collection, right? Yeah, so this condition emerges in stage 1. You're right. Okay. In some sense, stage two is just, okay, just like hard computation. Like so stage two is, is not a hard computation, but somehow is and ancillary, it's I would say. Proof, right? But the essence is in building a lot of... Yeah, so you see the threshold. I, the threshold is felt in stage one, I would say. Okay. Yeah, okay. because this is where you touch it, upon the weights. You actually ensure, right? So, so basically, every, after every epoch, you, you call the population by this factor, and then if... If this is still bigger than one, then you continue to grow. You don't die out. So yes. Is it related to? I mean, I don't remember the Is it related to this So this I cannot answer. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, maybe someone in the audience knows. What's the question? I think. I mean, the physicists definitely didn't have this picture, but the question is, you know, is, is something like that appears in the prediction when they did the replica calculation? Right? Because this looks, it's a similar flavor of thing. Right? You mean the cavity calculation? Yeah, right? the cavity calculation. But that, that is the, essentially the cavity calculation. Yeah, but I don't know if that's what they did, right? I mean, it's, it is a cavity calculation. OK, so let me. Do they have uh, such a sharp prediction with like the Bhattacharya? Uh, uh, they do. OK. So this is exactly a, uh, predicted in that uh, Samarjan et al. paper, uh -huh. PRE paper. Yeah. Yeah, they also predict what happened near the threshold. Yeah. Uh, OK, so let me use the remaining maybe 10 minutes to, to explain the, the briefly the second pro five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, just to uh, just to g give a quick uh, some quick exposure problem which is related but much harder, and so this is the quadratic Simon problem that underlies this statistical pr uh, question which is called graph matching. So you have two networks which you know they are correlated if you have the correct vertex correspondence, but you want to find w without it basically with the unlabeled graph. So you want to find the uh, a matching between the two vertices that maximally align the edges. Right, so solving this combinatorial optimization problem is very hard. It's called quadratic assignment, which is much harder than linear assignment. So linear assignment only have one pi here. So in the noiseless case, this is the graph isomorphism problem. Um, has many different applications. Uh, we're going to skip all of them, uh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> The old thing, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I shouldn't say because it's by some of the people here. Uh, but I think they are actually uh, real paradigms where this. Isn't there, don't worry about okay, it. sure. Wait, burger? Is it burger? Oh, no. no, it's a burger. No, she's, she's <laughs> no but these are good Sorry. applications. <laughs> No, and in fact, this is a very genuine application to, to see, to match objects 
uh, of course, it's all trivialized by neural nets now. Um, <laughs> so let me skip the applications. Uh, so this is very hard problem to solve, and uh, yeah, as, as we all know that you know, beyond worst case analysis, there is a lot of things that you can do. Right, real network are not that pathological. And they have latent structure, which you can capture with meaningful models. So one of the models that's emerged as a popular one is this correlated early terrain graph model, which is just say two early terrain graphs that has edges correlated. So um, let me quickly describe it. You can think about the mother graph gets sampled twice. And these are your two observations, except the second one undergoes a random reshuffling. And this is the matching that you try to reconstruct based on G1 and G2. So marginally, G1, G2 are just G and Q. And you want to find pi star. So the goal, again, is to achieve some good overlap. Right? I want to reconstruct this matching uh, with a good accuracy, make this as close to 1 as possible. So the key parameter measures the signal-to-noise ratio in a way is the average degree of the so-called intersection graph. Those edges are sampled twice. So it's roughly NPS square. Right? So if this is large, then you can do something. If it's too small, then you cannot. So the main results here is the following. Um, let's say there's a sharp threshold that determines whether you can achieve good th overlap or not. Let's say in the dense regime, where the, uh, the edge probability is subpolynomial. So there is indeed actually a sharp, uh, the all of nothing f phenomenon. There is a jump between the overlap from if you're above this threshold, it's almost perfect. If you're below, it's actually very close to 0. It's different from the picture we see before. So the interpretation of this can be done by just looking at the entropy. So there is a certain amount of mutual information the data give you about the latent matching. And you compare with log n factorial, which is the total entropy you need to resolve the pi star. So this is the interpretation. Of course, the proof goes by, you know, have to justify this in some way. Um, so let me maybe uh, discuss ramifications of the, this result is that here solving quadratic assignment is maximum likelihood again. And uh, the positive result is proved by computing the quadratic assignment. Uh, but there is no computationally efficient algorithm that is known for this, even for random instances. Right? For if in the extreme, so the only thing we know is something when the two graphs are extremely correlated. Right? So if it is perfectly correlated, right? so just two is isomorphic random graphs, then people know how to identify the, the matching. And there are other algorithms that succeed if you are 1 over poly log n away from this. In other words, you delete and add 1 over poly log n fraction of the edges, and you still find the matching. And, and the, I think the biggest open problem in this field is how to do it at the constant. And there are algorithms based on convex relaxations has strong evidence to succeed at that threshold, but no one can prove it. So in the sparse regime, we know less. So essentially, you can determine the threshold up to a constant factor of 4, let's say, if the average degree is poly log n. And, but there is no actual or nothing phenomenon here. So if you're above some threshold, you can achieve some overlap, non-zero. If you're below some other threshold, you can achieve no tri uh, non-trivial overlap. So there is actually a striking conjecture very recently uh, by Ganasali, uh, Lalarge, and Masulier that says, well, if you have the bounded degree regime, the exact threshold that happened at d times s square equal to 1, which is still open, I think it's a good problem to understand uh, in this case. So in, as I said, there is no all of nothing phenomena. Um, okay. So a very you know, quick outline of the proof. Uh, is by, by, so the hard part is to computing a very precise computation of the uh, mutual information between your data and the latent matching. So um, this is done by a truncated second moment method, which I don't have time to discuss. Um, and that we found in a paper where we studied the detection version of the problem. Then if you have a very accurate description of the mutual information, you can go back to the reconstruction error and the overlap by using some sort of a area theorem, morally. Right? You, can f you can try to connect 
mutual information to some integral of the reconstruction error using appropriate interpolating model between your model and something which is completely useless that is independent. So this can be done. Um, and then after that, you say, oh, if I cannot reconstruct the JCC matrix, I cannot reconstruct the matching. Yes, yes, please. Did you add equal equality or extreme equality? Uh, which, which one? Uh, the second one? Yeah. So second one is a approximation. It's an inequality up to the precision that is needed. Right. So but you don't get both. You, you cannot, you uh, I, th I think we were lazy. We just proved a one-sided bound for the purpose. I, I, I don't think it's that obvious, yeah. It's a bit non-standard to find well, because you're, you're observing two graphs, so. Uh, because I didn't even explain what it says, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is this approximate area theorem, which I think is probably tight, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good question, yeah. So the hard part is to r justify this, which I will have to skip, so it, there is a lot of cycles and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just conclude. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I presented two uh, planted assignment problem, one linear, one quadratic. You can find sharp threshold when you can achieve a good overlap or not. And uh, for the second part, I think a lot of the problem are still open, especially in the algorithmic domain. And both analyses rely on some version of the cycle decomposition. I didn't explain for the second one. Uh, I think I explained a bit too much about the first. And we observe some new phenomenon, for instance, this type of infinite order phase transition. There's a lot of open problems in this. For instance, determining an exact overlap, which requires you not just to analyze uh, linear assignment as achievability, but require to analyze that optimal one, which you can somewhat describe by message passing. And also in some very simple models. So this infinite order phase transition is actually not universal. Right? So there are examples where it's not infinite order anymore. For instance, it's just in a super simple model where you have a planted graph in a bipartite uh, 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 early rainy model with average degree a little bit bigger than one. So this is a crack threshold. And if you are above one, you cannot find the matching exactly. So what we proved in our paper, just as a quick corollary, is that this order is no longer infinite. You don't see e to the minus 1 over poly epsilon. So this is, the error is genuinely in poly epsilon. So we have some crude bound, which is between epsilon and epsilon to the 10th, let's say, or 8th. Uh, but to, to find it exactly is uh, something appears to be challenging. Uh, and then there's a lot of more recent extensions and also the question about it, is there a genuine information computational gap, especially for the second problem. I think this is the references, so thank you very much. Uh, okay, I think we are technically over time, so we'll have to take questions offline. So, uh, Yipong yeah, is going to be here, be here for what? Yeah. PM today, and uh, you're welcome to grab him or just stay. Like he can, he can answer your questions here. But yeah, you can come on. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you very much.